Greetings, fellow Beyonders. I am your humble host and scribe, Sven, and this is Beyond the Worlds Beyond. The primary purpose of this series will be exploring the lore and story within these campaigns. In this episode, we'll be looking at the sixth episode of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One, titled Fresh Fish. We'll be doing a quick summary of the episode and then diving into the lore questions that it raises and those that it answers. We return where we left off with Ame coughing up seawater following her repair of the statues and, thankfully, recovering swiftly. Understandably shaken and dealing with the falling rain, they decide to set aside the gallows problem for a moment and seek shelter at the nearby Ace of Wands, entering into the lair of said beast. After an awkward encounter with the cudgel in the drawing room, they meet Arlie Price and quickly find themselves in a meeting with Gallows himself. While somewhat putting himself forward as a simple brute, it is clear from his insight, forethought, and confidence that he is much more than that. Despite high tension and fraught nerves, the meeting goes surprisingly smoothly. They confirm that he is in possession of Wavebreaker and find out his price, a too-rich-for-them amount of coin or a favor. It seems that a local guild mage, Payne, is in a position of enough power that Gallows cannot easily make an example of the debts he is owed. If the party sees Payne brought low, so that Gallows can have his way, then the sword is theirs. He even softens the deal by offering up that Payne is likely stealing from the Imperial Treasury, providing both a reason they may not feel so sympathetic and an avenue to explore. Shaken, but alive, the party departs to find a place to stay for the night. While the flea house they find is far from high scale, they still manage to have a restful night as well as, in the morning, learning quite a bit of local lore from the staff. Deciding the next step, one way or another, is to make contact with the local guild mages. The party departs after, partly out of pity, deciding to rent the entire floor of the rooming house for a week to serve as a base of operations. They take a short detour to warn Finley, Gallows having shown great displeasure in his name having escaped the Hedge Mage's lips, and find that Ghost and Flicker have already made their own departure, presumably to try and join the Citadel. Finally, the party arrives at the Guild Spire, a mix of Imperial and Citadel designs and symbols, and are greeted with enormous fanfare as befitting Subi's station. And, for once, we end with our heroes not in danger. Or at least that's how it seems, but only time will tell. Before we start asking new questions, let's take a look at the ones we've asked before and see which, if any, we now have answers for. <clears throat> First, we had asked about the nature of the spirits represented by the statues, and we were gifted with a vast lore drop on them this episode, though questions do still persist. We learned that the woman is Arima of the Reaching Green, a fierce and conquering spirit queen, child of a great battle lord of the sky, who could only be calmed by her counterpart. That counterpart is Naram, the Wave Lord, a gentle spirit who taught the people of the coast how to swim and fish. It also seems like this is likely, but not yet assuredly, the reason for the enroaching kudzu, the destructive vines that Ame saw in her vision and that they now know await outside the walls. It seems that Arima's fury has returned and is no longer calmed by the gentleness of Naram. Perhaps due to the also recently activated Derek out beyond the harbor. Also, we receive more worrying insight, if not answers, as to Ursulon's dark days given his relationship with the city and with alcohol in general. I suspect we are in for much darker reveals to come. Not so much an answer, but we do finally get some catharsis of the tension between Suvi and Ame, with the two coming to terms, at least for now, as to their mindsets and issues. It is unlikely to be a final resolution, since they are still who they are, but it at least resets the clock on any potential conflict. Due to some middling roles, the full nature of Gallows is still unknown. He blinks, but not as often as you would like, and the state of his heartbeat is yet to be determined. We also have some more information to bedevil us about the naming conventions of wizards, mages, and the Citadel. We learn of a wizard still affiliated with the Citadel, who goes by the name Galani. So it is not that all Citadel wizards go by S names, though Suvi, when reaching for a cover name, still goes with another S with Sky. Perhaps the leadership track of the Citadel uses S names? Soft, Stone, Steel, and Silence were all such wizards, and Silver appears likely to be on such a path as well. 
Galani, in turn, is of the Researchers' Corps, though high up within it. We also learn of mages who are not currently serving the Citadel, Payne and Morrow, both of who are part of the guild mages that serve the Empire directly apart from the Citadel. Morrow may or may not, likely not, be a given name, but it seems unlikely that Payne is. So this matter of naming either extends outside of the Citadel, is copied by some mages perhaps out of envy, or may still mark those who trained with but did not remain within the Citadel. Which leads into the next question, which is why Payne has chosen such a moniker. It may be that he is just outright a villain and chose it from a point of sadism or maliciousness, but Brennan tends not to make things so easy on us or the party. We already know he's a gambler and likely a thief, which means there's likely a redeeming quality somewhere to make the decision to leave him open to Gallo's intentions a harder one. Perhaps he's not a dealer of pain, but one who struggles with it. Dealing with chronic pain, perhaps from the war, could lead to risk behaviors and distractions such as an unhealthy gambling habit. But all this is just conjecture for the moment and remains to be seen. Returning to the matter of spirits, one more question I doubt will be answered anytime soon, but immediately hooked me is exactly what is a Battle Lord of the Sky, and how many are there? Arima's father was said to be a Battle Lord of the Sky, implying that there are others. Also, are there other battle lords of other domains and elements? This is the type of stuff I love, and I really hope someday we can get answers to. That's all for this installment of Beyond the Worlds Beyond. As always, please feel free to throw your own questions and theories in the comments, as I love hearing what others latched on to. Also, please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you want more Worlds Beyond Number content, you can visit my Patreon, linked below, to find my Appendix and Timelines projects, all of which are free and publicly available. I've been your host, Sven, and thank you very much for listening. Farewell, for now, fellow Beyonders.